Well, good morning and welcome to Health Talk here on AM 1270 and 96.5 FM KXBX. <clears throat> My name is Paul Thomas. With us as always is Mr. Bill Kearney of North Lake Medical Pharmacies. And Bill, it's kind of crazy to think, but by this time next week, we'll have a new president. I know, and it is uh, uh, the, the stress that's going on with people. Yeah, and people the, are stressed out. And uh, depression, and it, it's, it's something that, it, it's like nothing's in order now. You yeah. know, everything's just kind of up. I was in the city yesterday and uh, made it to a, a doctor's appointment in CPMC, and was coming back and I was almost at uh, the the turn off for Highway 12 and I put my turn signal on to turn and uh, I was halfway in the lane and here this lady came up right in my lane almost hit me I swerved oh, to miss man. her and the person was coming up on my other side was honking his horn and I thought my gosh I you know I <laughs> Went all the way through the city, and I thought everything was okay. And then I found out I left my cell phone there at <laughs> uh, the doctor's office. And I thought, what? I need to stay in Lake County. And um, That stuff yeah. happens when you leave the comfort zone. Yeah, it is. It does. I, uh, I sponsored a bass tournament this weekend out at Canacta Vista for, uh, it was called Soldier's Wish. <clears throat> and I was talking to some of the guys who'd come from, smaller areas and uh, had had said what a beautiful place we have here and uh, the traffic that they had to deal with and leaving uh, their community to come here and uh, it, it is um, a relief but there isn't um, anything that we're spared from when it comes to this uh, electoral process that we're going through and I you know I was uh, I had on the news today coming in here and I thought this is just depressing me so I you know I, I bought <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I listened to audio books in my car, and I put a CD in there and uh, started listening to that, and at least took me into a different world. But uh, there's a lot to think about, and health care is one of the focuses of uh, the election uh, that's going on. Um, the uh, Trump campaign wants to, Republicans want to get rid of Obamacare. Yeah. Um, the uh, Hillary wants to keep it. However, we talked to people uh, in the last uh, week or so, and I've been traveling uh, to uh, Louisiana and uh, Illinois and Southern California and uh, that are uh, with um, Obamacare where their rates are going up uh, sometimes 60 to 65 mm. percent, um, and it's not affordable. And, of course, the hope for Obamacare was that the young people uh, who didn't really need uh, a lot of health care at this time would pay the higher premiums even though they wouldn't use them and uh, that would make it uh, less expensive for the people that are really sick well that did not happen you have states that took on um, the um, the uh, state program of uh, <coughs> what's it called here in california um, what the uh, covered california right covered california yeah. And those rates are going up considerably yep. too. Plus, uh, not just the premiums, but the copays. Uh, I just uh, give all my employees uh, pay for their insurance, and found out that on the particular insurance plan I have, that Sutter Health in uh, in Lake County is covered. But if you go to Sonoma County or San Francisco County, it isn't covered. And of course, the premiums have gone up, the copays have gone up, and uh, we just don't really. Uh, no, I was speaking with a store in um, uh, Los Angeles yesterday that I'm trying to bring into our co-op, uh, big store, uh, 90,000 square feet, and uh, the guy is trying to survive uh, doing the amount of prescriptions he has and looking for some way to um, continue to fill prescriptions without our reimbursements every time there's a, uh, they're, they're focusing on the cost of prescription care, of course, and when you do that, um, you uh, have a tendency to take away from the people that are giving you the prescription, which are the pharmacies. And, of course, pharmacies that are independent, that don't have huge front ends, aren't able to survive um, the, the profit loss that it's going, that's going to occur. And so uh, many times they, uh, they join a co-op or some sort of an organization that will give them a rebate program on at least generic manufacturers so they can continue to survive. But it's going to be um, uh, really uh, important in the future, and I have tell, told people uh, many times I've been giving uh, many kinds of 
uh, presentations to different groups. I'm giving one to uh, the women's group, civic group at um, the Clear Lake Riviera Friday afternoon. And, of course, one of the things we will be talking about is the election and uh, the two propositions that are most affected by uh, our business, of course, is uh, 52, uh, which has to do with whether hospitals will continue to do Medicaid or Medi-Cal. Uh, they are... Um, uh, they they do take Medi-Cal and Medicaid now. Uh, they for years they've been getting a um, a matching fund uh, up to three billion dollars from the federal government that will allow them to continue to process uh, Medi-Cal prescriptions and not be at a complete loss. So if that Proposition 52 does not go through. Um, there isn't, first of all, you must know there's nothing on, um, in the, the endorsement of these that doesn't have the support of the Republican, uh, Republican Party and the Democratic Party. It's a bipartisan support. Every hospital in California supports it. Uh, anybody involved with health care would support it uh, because we want uh, Medi-Cal people to at least be able to go to the hospital and get treatment and not for the hospitals to lose because of it. And this allows the federal government to continue to uh, provide uh, matching funds uh, for uh, the hospital to continue to take care of those people. That's 52, and uh, a yes would be the appropriate vote on that. The next one that's rather confusing is uh, Proposition 61. And 61 has to do with uh, whether or not a... Uh, the drug manufacturers can raise the cost of drugs paid for by the state of California. Now this is usually employees, uh, prisoners, uh, some uh, other than private people that are getting their prescriptions. So in the very first part of this campaign you would see the veterans getting up and saying um, you know vote yes on Proposition 61 so uh, our drug costs do not go up. Now you will see all the veterans groups doing a 180 and saying, please vote no on 61. The, the reason is, this is not the prescriptions that you and I get, and I'm a veteran. These are the prescriptions that are paid for by the state of California. I know, because of the profession I'm in, that the cost for veterans that, that the state pays for veterans drugs right now are the cheapest rate that anybody pays. Uh, even if they were raised 5 or 10 percent, uh, they still wouldn't be paid for by uh, the individual. They would be paid for by the state. I don't think any drug company out there considering the openness and the exposure to veterans being not taken care of by our government would raise the price of veterans medications, number one. Number two, we're talking about 12% of the population of California. 88% of the population would not be affected one way or the other. So, uh, and if you'll read the explanations behind the proposition, they will not give you a cost on what this would cost the state government or what it would benefit uh, the individual groups that are concerned. Now I noticed one or two ads on television that do give you a price, but um, when I evaluated this for the Chamber of Commerce, I said it's kind of roll the dice as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm a vet. Uh, I pay for uh, my medications, though, through my insurance company, uh, and I don't think veterans would be uh, in any jeopardy by uh, voting uh, no on Proposition 61. So um, it's kind of um, uh, up to you as an individual and up to your family on what you want to do. Uh, but um, it's a, a marginal thing as far as the financial effect it would have on the government or the financial effect it would have on veterans. But uh, that's just one part of the election. That's the part that uh, I have been involved with and talking to people about. Um, I am uh, more concerned with uh, our health the way it is right now. Uh, flu is uh, going to be getting here soon. If you haven't gotten your flu, 
uh, immunization, uh, get it as soon as you can. Uh, we're uh, way ahead of last year in immunizations. As far as people getting their flu and immunizations early, uh, it's not considered early now. November, December is when it usually hits and carries you through until April. So the, the one misconception that many people have is that you can get sick when you get the flu. I mean, the flu shot does come with some side effects, possibly, but um, they don't compare to the flu symptoms. It's no secret that it was designed to help protect you from getting sick from the flu. Um, but you can get a, uh, a small swelling at the site of the injection, depending on how uptight you are when you get uh, the medication, get the immunization. So um, it, it could cause some serious complications for the very young and the very old if you get the flu. Uh, we know that within uh, the influenza vaccine is a form of the flu, but uh, the chances that that shot can leave you sicker than before is really almost impossible. Uh, each flu shot protects against three to four viruses. We do a trivalent shot right now. Next year we'll be doing a quadrivalent. Uh, that means there's three viruses that are inactivated that are injected in, into you uh, to set up uh, immunity. And every once in a while, a person will come in contact with a strain that their shot doesn't protect them from. That's what happened when we did the flu mist in the last two years. Uh, it wasn't um, anything that uh, was going to provide you any immunity. I just had a little girl uh, last Friday or last Monday that needed a shot. And um, she was 12 years old, and uh, she wanted the flu mist, and I told her I couldn't get it, and she was crying, and um, we were able to give her, give her an immunization in the arm, and <clears throat> as soon as it was over, she, she laughed. I told her how brave she was, and her daddy was with her, and uh, then one of my employees had brought in a little puppy uh, dog uh, and showed her the little puppy, and all of a sudden she'd forgotten she'd ever had a shot, so... Uh, the vaccine is made from an inactivated virus, which means it's not even able to transmit infection. Uh, so people who do get sick have been uh, uh, contaminated before they've gotten their vaccine. The vaccine takes one to two weeks to kick in before it's in full force, although you get some effect immediately. Um, and because it mutates each year, that means it changes. That means the viruses that were good last year uh, probably aren't good this year. Last year was a good example of it not changing. That's the first time since I've been giving flu shots that it's uh, the same as it's always been. Um, it's important to get the new shot to protect yourself from the strains that are circulating and most likely to uh, outbreak in the current season. Um, you know, you can get a headache, you can get a nausea, uh, there are extreme reactions that are reported each flu season and though rare have been considered um, a, a problem at times but about two percent of those who are vaccinated experience a, a real type of a side effect uh, you're more likely to die from getting the flu than experiencing <clears throat> an adverse effect from uh, the flu vaccine so uh, it isn't a live vaccine it's an inactivated vaccine, so it's impossible for you uh, to get the flu from the shot. So if you haven't been immunized, uh, come in and get it. If you're over uh, 60, 65 years old, you need to look at getting, if you haven't gotten two pneumonia shots in your lifetime, you need to get the second one, which is either Prevnar 13 or uh, Pneumovax 23. Uh, we will ask you about that when you come in if you're of that age group. And a Zostavax, of course, for the shingles, uh, if you're um, exposed to or you think you, uh, you're more susceptible at that age, of course, to get the shingles. And, of course, we give tetanus, we give uh, hepatitis, we give uh, all the shots that you would possibly need except yellow fever. So um, our number is 263-5252 if you have any questions. Uh, be sure and uh, ask us. Uh, remember, the holiday is coming up, so you're uh, going to have to think about eating healthy. <laughs> we have, yeah, we've had. Uh, we um, have our annual Thanksgiving show. Yeah, yeah, where, where we talk about uh, 
Paul and I talk about what uh, we're not supposed to eat, and then we talk about what we're really <laughs> having. Really, yeah. and so um, it hasn't been a diet-type uh, uh, show, but it's... Um, hey, it's uh, one time a year where we get to really... That's right. You know pig out on the uh, i've got the, uh I'm, i we're going up to my daughter's in uh, rockland for uh, thanksgiving but we're taking the turkey because i want to make sure i was gonna say who's gonna deep fry the turkey or barbecue well what do you guys do you, we, you do both right we, or? we have we yeah. don't uh, do it in other people's homes because, <laughs> you burn their house uh, yeah i don't want to be uh it, it can get out of hand but it's a quick way to do it you sure you don't have to spend a whole lot of time you know i tried to convince my wife about doing the turkey on the barbecue this year because we're doing thanksgiving at my house to free up the oven space for all the other stuff and she's like no i don't want to do it i she needs to be in control of the basting of the turkey to make sure well it's, that's you kind know, of the moist. way kind of the, you know we do turkey uh, three or four times a year and and other than thanksgiving i do do it on the barbecue because mm -hmm. i i baste it with uh, uh, about every half hour with um uh, garlic salt and pepper and uh and butter or uh, a vegetable oil so it really seals the keeps it moist yeah the moisture i think it'd so. be a great way to do it but um you know i mean how how long are you doing it three or four hours out there yeah oh, yeah yeah on a low on, on an indirect uh, heat or in, indirect, indirect heat, yeah yeah and, and do you, uh, you you don't flip it i mean obviously no, i just leave it there yeah. and uh, I get a I get the baster and some of the juices that go down in the pan. I have a pan that I put it in and I just keep basting it. Do you have? There. Is it one of the disposable foil pans or do you have like an actual like roasting pan? That you uh, I do it both ways depending on the size. If you know, my wife has a tendency to buy these twenty some pound turkeys, <laughs> so you kind of have to almost have a bathtub yeah, to cook right. it in. You know, but. So I usually, if if you put it, if it's a heavy uh, turkey and you put it in one of those little aluminum pans and you go to take it out of there, yeah, they'll just just fall spills right all through, over. Huh, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. And, all uh, right. Woo. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, gender differences. You've heard us talk about uh, gender differences when it comes to medication, and until 1994, there wasn't a uh, way to. Um, uh, determine how a female would react to diseases or to medications uh, because we use strictly males to um, uh, to, to uh, get results from medications and diseases. Now we uh, have females as well and we're finding some big differences. Um, colon cancer, which was one of my uh, problems in the past, uh, uh, occurs earlier in men than women. About 35% more men than women are diagnosed with and die from colon cancer. Uh, they also tend to get the disease uh, at a younger age. Uh, I happened to be, it was 13 years ago, so that meant I was 60 uh, or 61. Um, one factor, we think female hormones, uh, estrogens and progestins may be uh, more protective. And the symptoms differ. Both men and women uh, have symptoms such as uh, rectal bleeding and diarrhea or constipation. But after that, it begins uh, to change. And uh, women are slightly more likely to have tumors located on the right side of their colon. Uh, those cancers tend to be more aggressive. Uh, and care, whether it differs or not, people should start screening at age 50, but uh, men are more likely to delay testing because we're men. Uh, if it wasn't for the symptoms that I had uh, early, I probably wouldn't have tested. Um, people put it off because they find it embarrassing, and as a result, cancers aren't found till later stages. You, you go to have a colonoscopy now. Uh, they give you a, um, a shot of Versed <coughs> and uh, some fentanyl. And uh, you're out, and you you wake up. You're laying there with your butt exposed, and you're feeling <laughs> they're violating me. And then you Woo! wake you wake Can't up, wait. and you say, uh, "When are you going to do it? It's already, yeah, it's already been done. done." So they don't give you they don't put you on gas. It's just a it's no, just a shot. To, just a shot. Just a yeah. shot. Um, you know, I you know, it's been a while since I'm I'm due to have another uh, colonoscopy. When they found um, my cancer, I had had uh, one colonoscopy and they didn't find it. And then I started having more symptoms and uh, they did find it. And I, then I was having a colonoscopy every 60 days. So uh, I got to where I wouldn't even take the Versed because I didn't want to, to be incapacitated for a day. So I let them go in and just cut out the polyps raw and 
they, they said, well, what are we supposed to do you do in, in post uh, surgery? And I says, you don't do anything. You just let me go home. I didn't have any anesthesia. It's just, what? Uh, so it wasn't, um, you know, it's, Ouch. time is our most important element. So uh, I've had enough pain that uh, it didn't bother me too much. Um, heart attacks are mostly overlooked in women uh, in the very beginning because they tend to strike women later in life, uh, an average age of 72 uh, compared with 65 for men, but they tend to be deadlier. Um, 26% of women age 45 and older die uh, in the year after their first heart attack compared with 19% of the men. Um, the symptoms we've talked about before, they, uh, they change. They are often uh, present with more subtle signs such as jar, back pain, nausea, shortness of breath. Uh, they may even be less likely to seek medical help because they don't even realize that they're having them. Um, care is about the same when a doctor suspects a heart attack. One of the first steps is to perform an angiogram, which looks for blocked arteries. Um, but they may miss a type of heart disease that's more common in win women called coronary microvascular disease, which damages the smaller arteries in the heart and don't necessarily show up. So. Men or women who've had a heart attack should be prescribed medication to protect their heart, such as low-dose aspirin, as well as blood pressure and cholesterol-lowering drugs, and uh, be referred to an exercise program, as well as uh, counseling for rehab. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, is more common in women than, uh, but deadlier in men is depression. We don't think of a depressed person as being, uh, being fatal. But women are about twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with depression um, because uh, the the hormone change in women is much greater than when than men and most but men are much more likely to commit suicide uh, women attempt suicide more but uh, men use more lethal means so um, the symptoms can be more difficult to recognize depression in men because it often appears not as a sadness but as complaints of being tired and irritable or loss of interest in their work or hobbies. Um, much of that might be due to cultural experiences of just how men think they should behave. When I grew up, um, men were not allowed to cry. Men were not allowed to uh, have negative thoughts. You were always the person who took care of the family and that was your job so uh, and though depressed women are more likely to overeat men tend to lose their appetite and drop weight uh, men also may use drugs and alcohol to self-medicate then mask the signs of the depression so uh, women probably respond better than men when it comes to taking antidepressants uh, and in either gender the um, ssris or those are what we call the serotonin reuptake inhibitors um, and in either gender, they've been linked to sexual side effects such as uh, erection problems in men and libido. And uh, <clears throat> if that's a concern, there are, are, are alternatives to take. Uh, and getting um, a man to take them um, is a lot more difficult than a woman because of the side effects. Uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about smoking cessation. Uh, is it harder for women to quit than men? Uh, and how does the care differ, or does it? Hi, I'm Bill Kearney from North Lake Medical Pharmacies, and recently I spent some time with some of the students in Mrs. Goodwin's third grade class at Lakeport Elementary School to discuss the importance of taking vitamins. I asked the students, why is it important to take your vitamins, and here's what they had to say. They give us big, strong muscles. They make us healthy. They help us grow tall. They're good for our eyes. They help us fight cold. They are good for our hearts. They are good for our hair. They are good for our teeth. They give us strong bones. North Lake Medical Pharmacy, a good neighbor pharmacy, is offering a healthy kids free vitamin program to the kids of Lake County. Any child aged 2 to 12 can receive a free 30 day supply of children's chewable multivitamins every month for a year. Simply sign up your children at either of our two locations at 347 Lakeport Boulevard in front of the Bruno Shop Smart. Call 263 1328 or at 5136 Hill Road East across from Sutter Lakeside Hospital. Call 263 6192. The Healthy Kids Free Vitamin Program at North Lake Medical Pharmacies. They're good for us! Who was your hero when you were a kid? 
Whether it was Joe DiMaggio or Jackie Robinson, Rosa Parks or Sally Ride, Bogart or Brando, you're just the right age to do something important that you can be remembered for. Even if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or beyond, you can register to become an organ and tissue donor. Surprised? You shouldn't be. Today, people of all ages and even with health conditions can sign up to donate the gift of life. And it's so important. Every age, every ethnicity is needed. If we all signed up, imagine the lives we could save. The families we could help. So whether you admire John Wayne or James Dean, Robert Redford or Roberto Clemente, Elvis Presley or Ella Fitzgerald, do something important that could make a real difference and change lives. Get the facts today and register to become an organ donor. Find out how at organdonor.gov or call 1-866-99-DONATE. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. Grandpa, look what I got. Wait till you see the bike we got for Jake. It is the coolest thing. Hearing loss happens gradually with age, making it easy to ignore. Yet most older Americans aren't getting their hearing tested. Dad, can you hear me? Untreated hearing loss can keep your loved ones from enjoying what they cherish most. Don't let that happen. Speak up about hearing loss. You'll be glad you did. Brought to you by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Okay, here are five important reasons why your son or daughter should play a high school sport. Number one. High school sports teach valuable life lessons like self-discipline, sportsmanship, and time management skills. Two. Teens who play a high school sport have better grade point averages and fewer disciplinary problems. Number three. High school sports help fight teen obesity and substance abuse. Here's number four. High school sports provide wholesome, constructive after-school activity, perfect for today's families. And number five. And high school sports are safer than ever before. Injury surveillance and research, better equipment, and the continuing education programs for coaches provided by state and national athletic associations have made high school sports safer than ever before. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. And we're back. Okay, we were uh, <clears throat> going to be talking about uh, people stopping smoking and whether it was harder for women to quit than men, and it is. Uh, they're less likely than men to succeed at quitting smoking. Uh, one of the reasons may be that they don't respond as well to nicotine replacement methods such as the gum or the patch. And we, we think for them smoking is less about fulfilling a nicotine craving but more about uh, smelling or seeing the smoke or even the social aspect of smoking uh, with others. Um, how symptoms differ? Most women report suffering severe withdrawal symptoms such as depression and cravings, anxiety, uh, difficult uh, concentrating. Um, if you're menstruating women and you're still having a period, uh, time your quit day to your period. Withdrawal is often worse in the second half of the menstrual cycle. Uh, among the drugs help to, uh, to help people stop smoking. Chantix works equally well in both genders, but the antidepressant <coughs> bupropion seems less effective in women. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Alzheimer's, which we're seeing a lot more of now as people are uh, living longer and uh, growing older. Um, about two thirds of Americans with uh, Alzheimer's are women. Uh, but that's probably because they live longer. There's a quicker onset in men, however. So Alzheimer's begins in men uh, about the age of 60, a uh, decade or so, which is 10 years earlier than in women, and it progresses a lot faster. <clears throat> the symptoms with men are less likely to have uh, obvious memory loss, possibly because the brain's memory center is less likely to be affected by the disease. Um, according to the Mayo Clinic, uh, instead they'd be more likely to have behavioral symptoms such as aggressiveness and agitation. And we see that a lot in skilled nursing when uh, I was doing skilled nursing when um, a husband or wife, um, husband would go in the hospital and a wife would come. Uh, he would be accusatory sometimes of her having an affair with somebody else and there was nobody else. 
Um, women go through uh, menopause before age 45, have a higher chance of developing the disease. So if somebody was uh, had a hysterectomy, say at age 30, <clears throat> they would be more likely to go into uh, Alzheimer's earlier than women uh, who didn't. The average age uh, is about 51. Uh, being overweight is more likely to contribute to the dementia in women than in men. Um, Parkinson's disease, which is uh, more likely uh, in men than women, um, they don't know why. Um, though some estrogen may have uh, a protective effect in women. Um, it's easier to miss the early stages of Parkinson's uh, in women because they're less likely to get proper treatment. Uh, for example, they're 22% less likely to see a neurologist and then they need more close monitoring with levodopa, which is the main drugs <clears throat> that's used. So we see uh, things change as well as uh, medication that affect uh, women more than men. Uh, beta blockers, which are used uh, most usually for uh, high blood pressure and sometimes for essential tremor, for stage fright, because they are a tranquilizer on the heart. So when your heart is under stress or your body is under stress, this keeps your heart from reacting. In fact, when you're doing a stress test like you're going to have to do, Paul, and you're taking a beta blocker, <clears throat> many times they'll take you off that beta blocker because it lowers your heart rate down mm -hmm. considerably. So if you're taking a beta blocker, they'll take you off of it before, because the goal in doing a stress test is to get your heartbeat up and see how your heart performs when uh, the heartbeat is accelerated. Sure. If you can't accelerate the heartbeat, and many times you can on a beta blocker, they'll take it away. Uh, those drugs uh, prescribed for high blood pressure after a heart attack seem to have a stronger effect on women than on men, at least when they're exercising. So um, that's especially true for metapropolol, which is Lopressor or Toprol. So women taking the drugs may uh, need to be monitored more closely, and uh, they should also talk with the doctor about adjusting their exercise regimen just in case of that. Uh, Coumadin, which is used all the time for uh, blood clots and uh, and warfarin is the generic name. Women are more prone to internal bleeding from this powerful blood thinner, often prescribed for uh, conditions that increase the, the risk of blood clots, such as abnormal heart rhythm. Uh, AFib is what we ta talk about a lot using warfarin. Now we have um, a lot of non-warfarin type uh, drugs on the market, like Eliquis and various ones like this that uh, are um, at work without have, having you take an INR, which is a lab test to determine what your clotting time is or a pro time. So um, conditions that increase the risk of blood clots, such as abnormal heart rhythm, uh, may explain why women are less likely to stay on the potentially life-saving drug and underscores the importance of careful monitoring while it's on this medication. Probably the least expensive medication to take for AFib, but one that requires monitoring more closely than any other medication. We can adjust the bleeding time with uh, uh, warfarin or Coumadin when we find out that you have a slow clotting time and it needs to be increased or vice versa um, by changing the dose. On the non-warfarin types of medications, if bleeding starts, it's much harder to stop. Now, you'll see the ads on television say, less likely to cause bleeding. But what they don't tell you is if bleeding starts under that medication, it's much harder to stop that. So uh, Zipolidem, which is Ambien, and it's generic. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, if you remember, lowered the recommended dose for women for that sleep medication from 10 milligram to 5 milligram because it uh, clears their system very slowly, increasing the risk of morning after effects, such as driving impairment and um, uh, other things that would happen with you that uh, doesn't get out of your system. So it's important for you to uh, uh, observe that, even if you think you need to take a full dose, just remember what happens when you do and the risks. So, um, the, the other thing is alcohol with drugs and what medications and alcohol don't mix. Um, if you find anything that depresses the nervous system, 
Um, these meds can cause problems when taking with alcohol. Anti-anxiety drugs such as Xanax or Valium or Ativan. Uh, you have an increased risk of dizziness and drowsiness and overdose slowed or difficult breathing. Uh, if you remember, we talked about uh, some time ago about all the heroin overdoses and all the, the oxycodone when people would go through rehab and then they would start taking uh, the same dose they were taking when they got out of rehab and uh, they relapsed and they started taking the same dose they were taking before and it killed them. Uh, the same thing can happen with anxiety medications. If you had built yourself up to two or three milligrams of Xanax and all of a sudden, uh, and, and you can get addicted uh, to, to these drugs, um, and, you, and, and it's really harder to withdraw from benzodiazepines, which are Ativan and Xanax um, than, and Valium, uh, than it is to come off uh, oxycodone. So uh, you go back to that same dose and you're in trouble. Uh, antihistamines, and we think those are safe, but now you have non-sedating antihistamines, which are <clears throat> on the market, which um, do Zyrtec and um, the diphenhydramines and the chlorophenaramines, the old ones, uh, have a tendency to uh, cause you some sedation. You add alcohol to those and the same kind of situation happens. <coughs> Excuse me, some antibiotics, not very many, <coughs> but have an increased risk with, of alcohol, and you don't think of these uh, many times. Uh, a ZPAC. Um, you have increased possibility of nausea, vomiting, and flushing, um, increased constipation from them, uh, doxycycline, which is um, a, a, a cycling like tetracycline, only you take it less often, erythromycin, and of course, flagyl, which is metronidiazole. And flagyl treats a kind of bacteria that's in, uh, encapsulated in a cell, and it's called an anaerobic bacteria, and it doesn't penetrate, um, most antibiotics do not penetrate that cell membrane. <clears throat> when you take flagyl, it does penetrate that cell membrane. But there is an increased chance of having violent kinds of nausea and vomiting because years and years ago, and it's still on the market, there was a drug called antabuse. And antabuse was a drug that you took if you were an alcoholic and you wanted to stop drinking. And that was before they had mind uh, drugs that helped get you through it. Uh, this drug uh, caused you to get violently ill. So when you took a sip of whiskey or vodka or beer or wine, you would get violently ill. This drug metabolizes into that drug when you take it. So even though it has nothing to do with you drinking, the chances can be when you get a, uh, a form of um, reaction from it <clears throat> that it can be a violent reaction. So uh, blood pressure drugs... Uh, such as uh, catapril and nifedipine and diuretics uh, can cause some problems. We don't always tell you not to drink with uh, those drugs because they're calcium channel blockers. Uh, normally they don't, don't affect you, but they can. Uh, the Coumadin that we just talked about with alcohol, internal bleeding with occasional drinking, uh, blood clots, clots and strokes, um, because it thins your blood in a sense alcohol does <clears throat> has it it moves more freely through the system and can get caught up in the plaque that we have inside those arteries um, cholesterol drugs such as statins uh, a tor of a statin simvastatin uh, again nothing that you would realize except liver damage is a possibility and it used to be when we would prescribe uh, the the statin medications after 30 or 60 days we would do a liver function test and find out if it would affect your liver at all. <clears throat> now about once a year we do what we call an LFT, a liver function test, and test and see whether or not there, whether you have symptoms or not, whether or not there's been any elevation in your liver enzymes. Uh, and once you get off of that, if that is causing an elevation in those enzymes, uh, once you discontinue using that statin, uh, those liver enzymes 
you know, rebound and are back to their normal levels again. So um, just so you know, it's a, it's a possibility. And when a doctor asks to take an LFT or liver function test when you're on a statin, it's very justified. <clears throat> Muscle relaxants, again, remember what I said about anything that would cause your central nervous system to be depressed? A muscle relaxant can relax you, uh, such as Soma or Flexerel. You get the dizziness, the drowsiness, the increased risk of seizures when you add alcohol to it. Um, so just remember, uh, when we put that sticker on, don't drink alcohol, and may cause drowsiness, you're aware that there could be a side effect with that medication. Uh, if you add alcohol. Um, I don't think we need to tell you about opiates. You know that already. Um, you'll see less and less people taking opiates, including yourself. If you have chronic pain, uh, they're going to be less available as time goes on, and there will be substitutes that are maybe uh, mechanical or another way to stimulate uh, relief from pain receptors. Um, over-the-counter pain relievers, uh, pain relievers such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, Tylenol. <clears throat> we talked briefly last week about Tylenol. If you take a acetaminophen and have a glass of wine, there's a chance, a rare chance, but there's a chance that you could go into complete liver failure, and people have done it before. Uh, you think it's safe, well, just think about your Norco. Now you've got an opiate and you've got acetaminophen, and then you're adding alcohol to it. You just increase your risk of something uh, bad happening to you, although the, um, you know, the odds are low, but there is still a possibility. And then the sleep drugs, you know, such as um, Zipolidin and Sonata. Um, it's um, uh, not unusual at all. Uh, anything that you're going to take to cause you to sleep better and you combine alcohol with it. And I've talked to people about this a lot because 90% of the time it doesn't happen. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden it does happen. And <clears throat> the uh, people that are in the limelight in Hollywood are frequently people who take that risk. And they've done it for so long it doesn't bother them anymore. And then all of a sudden, both of those drugs kick in at the same time, and then you're really in trouble. So uh, I know I've given you a lot of information over uh, these things about uh, gender differences and uh, differences in uh, medication with men and women, differences in diagnosis with men and women, differences in treatment with men and women. But it's something you, you really need to think about because for years and years, uh, we've treated both genders uh, the same when it came to medication, and we're finding out there's a huge difference, and we will continue to find out more differences. Um, you'll hear a, a, a lot in the near future about a more focus on using shorter uh, courses of antibiotics. Um, we used to tell people, and we still do, to, to tell the, take the full course of antibiotics, even if they feel better. <coughs> Excuse me, and our explanation is this. When we told you to take 10 days worth of antibiotics and in five days you were doing fine, all the history indicates that you were uh, not, your body was not ready to take over after uh, five days, and you needed to take the extra five days to make sure that your immune system was up running on its own and didn't need that extra spurt of the antibiotic. Uh, now more experts say shorter is better. Um, longer courses are actually more likely to lead to resistance partly by increasing uh, the normal uh, flora inside our intestines uh, that's exposure to antibiotics that short courses work as well for many infections. Uh, we're already starting to see the shift. Um, up to 10 days used to be the norm for uh, uncomplicated uh, bladder infections, but now we know that three days of, uh, of septra or trimethoprim uh, is um, usually enough. Um, consider the type and severity of infections, uh, antibiotic choice and the patient, and um, many times they're going to discourage the use, long-time use of this because we're developing such a resistance to them. 
Uh, five days of antibiotics can be given instead of 10 to 14 days from any uncomplicated skin or kidney infections. Um, for community-acquired pneumonia, it's usually okay to stop antibiotics after just five days uh, if the patient hasn't had a fever to two to three days. But here again, we're putting the responsibility on you as a patient to communicate with your physician, and we don't see that happening. Uh, remember, every day I tell you healthcare is changing, and you're going to have to be more and more responsible. Um, at at that uh, point, uh, two to four days is often all that's needed to treat bladder infections in most school-age kids uh, without a fever instead of seven to 14 days. Um, but for strep throat, you need to continue to take the 10 days worth of penicillin or amoxicillin. The full course is needed to uh, eradicate the bug. Now, again, th this really isn't your choice. And if you go to a doctor and said, I just listened to Bill Kearney on uh, KXBX, and he's telling me that I don't have to take this antibiotic as long as you're prescribing it for me. That's not a wise thing to do. I, you know, I was in a doctor's office in uh, San Francisco yesterday, and uh, I kept my mouth shut when he was telling uh, my wife uh, the things that she needed to know to treat her disease, um, a as well as the medication that he was prescribing. And not saying that he wasn't right, I just know that um, I, I don't normally tell a physician that uh, he or she is wrong. Um, antibiotics usually aren't required for bronchitis, and you're seeing more and more of that sinusitis, which is um, um, where your sinuses get filled up. They're even saying with, uh, with pink eye, since uh, those are typically viral, you don't necessarily need it anymore. I disagree with that. I've had um, a history of having conjunctivitis or that, um, and uh, it's always responded to an antibiotic drop. Um, <clears throat> especially when you have symptoms and you say you're a child and you're going to school and you've got that red eye that's dripping and... <laughs> Uh, you probably need two or three days of an antibiotic to uh, at least uh, clear it up so it doesn't look so bad. Um, it's one of those things that uh, shorter courses uh, often work as well as longer courses for many of those infections, but it isn't for us to determine whether those infections are um, uh, what kind of antibiotic is needed. When I was working in a hospital, uh, in, in the Army, uh, I would make ward rounds with the physicians because we were in a field hospital and uh, up in the mountains. And when we made rounds with the doctor, and they do these in bigger hospitals too uh, in the city and maybe out here at Sutter, you make rounds with the physician. The physician tells you um, what the condition is and what the diagnosis is and then asks the pharmacist, uh, what would you prescribe for this, or what do you have in your formulary? In the military, it was uh, usually what's in your formulary because you know, we were uh, not a full-fledged hospital. We were a field hospital, and uh, we didn't have uh, a lot of the fancy medications that they have uh, today. So uh, it's um, uh, important to get the pharmacist's knowledge about uh, what's available and whether or not we should... Uh, prescribe it or not, knowing the conditions, and pharmacists, of course, uh, throughout uh, the country are becoming um, more and more uh, prone to uh, have that kind of information available and have uh, the luxury of prescribing medications. Um, last thing we have is uh, uh, new warnings will raise questions about when, what to use for teething pain. A lot of you don't have children that are young anymore, but you have grandchildren, and um, uh, the son and daughter come home and want to leave the child with you while they go to their family reunion or something, and or their class reunion. <clears throat> They're getting a lot of um, reports of seizures and uh, lethargy. In um, the thing that we've always recommended, and that's Highlands baby teething uh, tablets. So uh, they're going to be. Um, probably taking it off the market. Um, what they advise, and this wasn't always effective for me as a father of twins, 
was uh, gently massaging the baby's gums with a clean finger or offering something to chew on, such as a teething ring or a wet washcloth, um, and chilling uh, them because they're cool and has a numbing effect on them. Um, I, th they'd said discontinue using teething necklaces. There's no evidence they work and could lead to choking or strangulation. I don't even know what those are. Um, and not to turn to local anesthetics such as benzocaine or lidocaine. Uh, they aren't likely to help and the baby's drooling can quickly wash them away. And they can numb the mouth and interfere with swallowing. Back in my day, my alcoholic father would always use brandy or whiskey and rub on my gums. And it seemed to work, <laughs> you know. And I still like it today. I was uh, just going to say, I do the same thing yeah, to myself. Yeah. Every, whenever, you know, whenever, every chance I get when whenever, I have a sore tooth, just yeah, rub it on there. Rub some whiskey on it. So uh, the benzocaine is actually linked to uh, another kind of blood disease that leads to cyanosis and shortness of breath. And remember, all these things are to the extreme. Uh, many of you as parents have used all of these things. Uh, viscous uh, lidocaine, which we use uh, a lot uh, for people who are having uh, cancer uh, radiation or something in the inside of their mouth is raw. The mucous membrane um, is linked to seizures and cardiac arrest and death in young kids. So that would not be uh, the, the drug of choice. Uh, actually, acetaminophen or ibuprofen instead, uh, if a med is needed, is probably the, uh, the, the drug of choice. So um, as medicine changes, we have to change with them and have to be uh, assured that um, we're doing the right thing for our child. You will also see less uh, codeine being prescribed for kids. Uh, it's metabolized to morphine by an enzyme that we have in there, so uh, fast um, uh, meta, uh, metabolic change uh, can get toxic of morphine uh, levels, so um, you won't see near as much prescriptions for pain or cough for kids. Um, for mild to moderate pain, again, it's acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Uh, there's some evidence that the combination works better than the other. Remember, acetaminophen is a uh, analgesic. Ibuprofen is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So we would like to remind you we're North Lake Medical Pharmacies with two locations for you. At 5136 Hill Road East across from Sutter Lakeside Hospital. Call us there at 263-6192 or outside the Bruno Shop Smart at 347 Lakeport Boulevard. Give us a call there at 263 263- one three two eight. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Bill, and we'll see everybody back here again next Wednesday at ten AM for Health Talk on AM twelve seventy and ninety six point five FM KXBX. Lakeport.